Hello everybody, my name is Ian Blackshire from uh, Layer 47. I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to uh, our bi-weekly webinar. Um, this week we're, I'm joined by Zahid Anwar from Next.io and the, um, we're going to be introducing to you um, the Next.io solution and, and the topic is um, how to virtualize your network and I.O. So this is a particularly exciting area, one that um, we, we've um, had some success in and, and I think you're going to find it really, really, really interesting. So um, it's one of the, it's a really innovative product that, um, as Zahid will talk about, uh, can make some really dramatic cost savings um, and give you sort of almost infinite flexibility in terms of virtualizing your network and I.O. resources. So in terms of um, the uh, structure of the webinar, the, um, you're, you're currently on mute, so uh, we'll take questions at the end. Um, and if you could, at that stage, there's a question um, facility within the GoToMeeting uh, uh, taskbar that you can use. So in terms of um, the timing, we aim to uh, take about an hour. That will be structured in terms of um, brief sort of introduction from me in terms of layer 47. And then I'm going to hand across to uh, Zahid who's going to talk you through the next IO sol solution. Now that will be structured in terms of a sort of a, uh, looking at the business overall business problem and the technical problem, uh, and then Zahid will do some for, uh, a demonstration of the, the product in action. Uh, as I say, there'll be a question QA session at the end, and then in terms of uh, a possible next action, one of the things that you know, we always encourage our clients to do is to take product on trial and try it in your own environment. So I'll be talking about that. Um, the ability to do that at the end of the webinar. So I just wanted to um, spend a, a brief amount of time just introducing you to, net, to layer 47 and the types of work that we do. Um, we've been around as a company for more than 10 years. We're part of a bigger group, the JetNexus group, and um, the types of technology areas that we get involved in are um, WAN optimization, we do a lot of load balancing, so there's a number of technologies that we use in that area. Um, we have a big, large portfolio of storage uh, manufacturers that we, uh, we have a lot of expertise in. And um, an area that obviously we're talking about today is data center optimization, so we're constantly looking at solutions that can uh, provide flexibility and drive down costs for our clients. And obviously, um, you know, we've got lots of experience in terms of virtualization. Um, in terms of our, some of our clients, we, we deal with um, a large number of e-commerce clients, uh, public sector, a uh, number of hosting clients as well, and obviously sort of general corporates. One of the things that um, we're constantly doing is reviewing the marketplace and looking for innovative technology that um, is going to help our clients uh, give them flexibility and also help them to drive down their costs. And, and particular areas that we, we're we focused on at the moment is, is looking at VDI and the different options that you have there. So uh, one area that we're um, going to be running a webinar on in the new year is um, sort of the, there's a number of software based caching solutions that enable you that you can sit on top of traditional storage environments that give you the sort of performance that you need. Um, and we're also making going to be making a number of announcements um, to do with uh, SSD and, and flash storage and working with a number of ver uh, vendors in that area. So. Um, we run these webinars um, bi-weekly uh, on Thursday at 3 o'clock. 
Um, the next one we're running is on the uh, 13th of December, and that's going to be in conjunction with NETA. Um, and uh, there we're going to be talking about their V-series solution, which is basically uh, the software element of NetApp that you can layer in front of any other storage solution. So it gives you all of the, um, the features of a NetApp solution in terms of dedupe, caching, um, and so on. And, but you can layer that on top of uh, your traditional storage environment. And then um, in the new year, we've got a number of different themes. And the first of those is going to be uh, based on optimizing your, your website and improving um, how you, you manage traffic and um, you get the best performance out of your website. So very briefly, uh, just some of the clients that we, we deal with. Um, so th there's a whole mixture there and some of those are uh, WAN optimization based clients that we, um, we work with with Riverbed. Um, there is a number of there that use uh, our load balancing solutions. And um, there's a number, of, number there that um, have our storage solution as well. So I've, I've just been told that I haven't been sharing my screen. So um, that's a, a bit of a schoolboy error. So apologies for that, um, but you should be now seeing a screen that's um, got some of our clients on it. So in terms, of, so that was a, as much as I um, wanted to say about um, layer 47. Um, I was now going to hand over to uh, Zahid, who's going to give you um, an overview of the um, next I/O solution. I'm just waiting for it right, okay. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah, well I can see Let's see. Just wait for my um laptop to catch up, I think it's still showing the Okay, that looks like it's in full screen. Okay, thank you, Ian. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ahid Amar, as Ian said. I, I, I um, look after uh, channel sales, really, with, uh, for Next.io. I um, haven't been with the company that long, but uh, uh, Next.io has fortunately been around uh, <laughs> for, for quite some time, longer than I'd expected when I joined. So um, I'll, I'll just give you a quick uh, introduction to um, the company. Uh, headquarters in... Uh, Austin, Texas, uh, quite a few other tech companies, as you, as you probably know there, uh, quite close to Dell. Um, some of our, our customers are listed there, and we, we, we do have um, uh, OEM relationships with, with, with some of these uh, larger vendors. Um, our core competence really is in uh, PCI switching, and if you, if you Google Next IO and Payton, uh, what you'll find is, what goes returned is, that we have a number for shared I.O. in multiple um, operating system architectures, and that's for both fiber channel and Ethernet. And, and for, long time, for a long time, we've been a key contributor to uh, the PCI Special Interest Group. And our CT, former CTO, he actually uh, drafted and wrote and developed the um, uh, protocols and standards and spec for uh, uh, I/O virtualization uh, in PCI. So there's a couple of types of I/O virtualization: uh, single route and multi route. Uh, we'll, we'll explore those a little bit more uh, in a moment. But um, we've been actually been doing that for uh, a number of years, but mostly to um, uh, as a silicon design um, company. It's only uh, in the last five years, I, I suppose we've actually had product, and again, um, our core products over the last few years have uh, again been based around um, resources that you make available to servers by uh, through PCI switching. Um, 
the reason you see NVIDIA in the bottom right corner there is that we have uh, an appliance um, called vCore, which allows you to put a, plug a, a bunch of um, NVIDIA GPUs uh, and then share those out to, to servers. Um, the product we're talking about today, though, uh, is VNet Maestro, which uses the same sort of concept to be able to um, have centralized uh, networking resources which you then share out to, to servers in, in the same sort of way. A uh, little bit about our, our reach there. We've got um, uh, offices uh, here in six countries, actually, US, UK, uh, Russia, Japan, China, and even as far as far Korea. Um, the sales teams in each region, and um, customers across those regions as well. Sorry, I was just trying to gather my notes there. So, uh, yeah, so, so, so although the, the product that we were looking at um, was launched about a year ago, our, uh, the technology that it's built on has a longer pedigree, and the, the company itself has been going for some, some years. Before we take a, a, a deeper dive at the technology, I wanted to sort of take a, a look back at how we've got here and why this sort of technology is important in today's data centers. So, uh, and we'll do that by looking at how um, virtualization itself uh, as a technology has evolved. So if you go back probably to uh, the mid-90s, early 90s, um, every, a single server would generally run a single application and it would own all of the resources in that server. So uh, the CPU, the memory, um, storage was typically internal to, to the server and I.O. Uh, as well in some form of a network interface card. And you, you'd have, uh, as I said, a single application which would be using all those resources. Um, and back in, I think it was 1992, Three, actually, I, I first came into uh, IT, and those resources were quite expensive in those days. I remember uh, chatting to a, cha a guy from Kingston, um, and uh, you know they, they used to resell memory for uh, different servers. Um, he, <laughs> one time he told me that he used to be scared to actually go to the toilet because in case he missed a call for a large uh, memory order. Whereas these days, all of those components um, have become commoditized. Um, and the, 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 partly because all, all of those components, especially CPUs, have got multiple cores. They've been um, the, 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 uh, the, the fabrics that they're, they're built around have got much thinner. You can fit a lot more compute onto the, the same CPU footprint. And memory as well has got cheaper. So when you couple that with virtualization technology like VMware, what it does is allow you to run far more applications on that one server. And as the components therein get more and more powerful, so you can run more and more applications. But typically, uh, the I.O. that's in there is still going through uh, traditional components, network interface cards, HBA, and that kind of thing. Are you still with me? Okay, so the, the, the I.O. as the last point here uh, described is still tied to the platform, whereas all of these other resources have been virtualized. Uh, and if you, uh, in, including the storage actually, and that's very often completely outsourced or centralized to um, a, a SAM. So on the right here, what we're proposing is to actually decouple the I.O. as well from the server. So the whole server becomes a commoditized component. And when I mentioned um, SRIOV and MRIOV, this is where um, our collaboration, if you like, with some of the, the other vendors in the uh, PCI-SIG, uh, vendors like Intel and Emulex, what they were able to use SRIOV for in virtualized environments is to make a a single physical adapter, if you like, present itself as um, a virtualized resource to different OSs in a, in a virtualized environment. So a single Intel NIC can appear as a number of 
virtual NIC to different OSs that, that are running under VMware, for example. The issue is that that, that is still a physical adapter that sits in uh, a server, and that adapter is only available to that server, whether it's running or not, or whether it's active or not, or the applications are, are online or offline. Um, and what we have done is taken up a step further with multi-root IOV by actually removing that adapter altogether from the server and making, um, making it available through PCI switching to uh, a number of servers. So that, that's multi-root um, IOV, so this is a quick explanation of that for you. It's, uh, uh, so in a um, typical data center, what, what we'll find is, um, so, so, so our, our product is a rack-based appliance. Um, what we deliver is IO consolidation and virtualization within the rack. So typically in a rack you have um, a number of servers <coughs> which will be connected to um, fiber channel switches if you have fiber channels and um, Ethernet top of rack switches um, to connect the server to the LAN. If, if anybody's ever opened a, a door at the back of a server, they'll, they'll see they're immediately confronted by uh, usually a, a whole spaghetti full of Ethernet cables. Um, occasionally they are very neatly zip tied uh, around the edges to, to allow better cooling, but the actual cable count is, is actually well, massive. Um, typically you'll find a server will have uh, a number of network interface cards, uh, possibly, uh, or, or typically I should say, that they, they operate in a one gig environment within the, within the server, sorry, within the rack. So you may well have three or four quad one port, um, what, one gig cards um, in, in the back of the server, plus um, what we're illustrating here, the red ones are um, host bus adapters to get connect to your five channel SAM. So they go to the SAM via these five channel switches. So, so if you just look at the, the component count in there that is actually carrying I.O., it is actually very significant in the rack. So a number of NIC switches and cables. And what we're proposing is to simplify that. If, if anybody if you ask anybody who has had next IO uh, what they know about them, <laughs> one typical response is less cables. Uh, and yes, indeed, we do reduce the number of cables dramatically. So where you had uh, five channel cables or, or optical cables uh, plus all the Ethernet cables, all of that is reduced down to two. Uh, so yes, we do that, and, and, and that's important for a number of reasons, uh, but it actually facilitates much, much more than just making the back of your rack look tidy. So let's just uh, have a quick look at this infrastructure anyway. So as I said, we're a top of the rack appliance, so we typically have uh, two of our VNets at the top of the rack, but instead of all of the I.O. components that were in the rack before, um, they've all been consolidated and moved into the appliances. Um, and the, the servers themselves, instead of having up to 18 cables as the previous slide showed, uh, we just have two uh, two cables going into uh, PCI slots into the server and um, into the back of our appliance. The back of the appliance can accommodate um, up to 15. Uh, it has 15 slots, uh, and into those slots you can either put um, uh, attach a single server or, or two servers. Uh, a single uh, occupying one slot per server will give you 20 gigabits per. Cable, so, so that's the current uh, speed of PCI. So the server now has typically two of these for redundancy, but uh, the, the, they obviously the, the bandwidth can be used all the time. So the server is able to have 40 gigabit uh, up to the top of the rack. And of course, the uh, the cable count has gone down. Um, I'll, I'll show, as Ian said, I'll show the user interface in a bit more detail at the end, but the, at the bottom it, it shows that actually configuring the resources, so the virtual NICs, HPAs, is a simple matter of sort of drag and drop from a user interface. So when you actually want to um, add, more, uh, add more of these, traditionally what you've had to do, if I go back to that previous one, is uh, find a free slot in the server and um, pop the NIC in and then 
uh, obviously wire it up and cable it up to your top of rack switch, uh, find a free port if you, if you have one, and then get that assigned to, um, uh, the, the, to a port at the, at the core. So a, a, a lot of effort, and, um, and that's just for adding each one of the, these cards every time you do that. Uh, and obviously the server needs to be brought down to do it. And instead, what we're proposing is being able to provision that um, just on the fly. Uh, and we'll see that in a bit more detail. I just want to show you some of the, uh, or talk about some of the um, challenges and business benefits that, that we get out of th this sort of uh, infrastructure. So, uh, well, and to be honest, they're, they're very similar to anything that you enjoy through virtualization in, in any other part of the data center. So your, your storage, for example, in uh, virtualizing into a, a SAN. Um, this has got the same sort of benefits uh, for, for I.O. So and they encompass you know, budget, deployment, availability, all of these challenges, which, which aren't getting um, that they're not disappearing. I mean, we're in the middle of a recession, and uh, all of these, any savings across any of these areas become uh, extremely important. Um, so before we look at those in a bit more detail, I, I think just to, just to revisit the, the appliance in a bit, um, look at that a bit closer. What you see there is the front of the, the appliance, which has a number of slots, uh, which you can populate with either fiber channel um, adapters or Ethernet ad adapters. Um, I, I said all of the I/O, uh, all of the I/O typically in the rack will be uh, across those components, but in each server. And what we've effectively done is moved all of those components and consolidated them to the top of the rack. So, uh, and and then we provision those uh, back to each server um, through a GUI. Uh, the you're free to populate whatever you, you like in here. So if you haven't got a fiber channel 10, you can, uh, you can put it, it, um, 10 gig Ethernet cards in, in all of these. Uh, or you can just put one of each in, and then as your estate grows, you add more cards. So th there isn't the need to um, fill all of these eight slots with uh, 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 right at the outset. So it's a sort of pay as you grow. Uh, model and pairs you need the bandwidth model. So a few metrics on um, what those uh, business benefits actually relate to. Um, typically we'll see uh, capital cost savings. Uh, so so in, in a typical rack, if you look at the traditional components or the cost of the traditional components, uh, remember in the previous slide that there's a huge number of those. So uh, you, you, you'd probably have more than one or two network interface cards in each server. You'd probably have a couple of HPAs and all those cables, plus, of course, all the top of the rack switches and fiber channel switches as well. Exchanging those for our uh, for VNets with a couple of cables and two very simple cards uh, can typically save you around about 22%. Uh, and just to give, give, um, uh, give put some numbers to that, uh, or, or some actual pricing, uh, if you look at um, you know, a, a good SSP and HPA, uh, uh, you're probably talking about four to seven hundred pounds for each adapter. And if you have a couple of those in a server, that's already fourteen hundred pounds. If for for us, the the server, once you've installed the PCI cards, and the PCI cards are, are just passive, they're they're fairly straightforward PCI cards which extend the PCI bus up to our appliance. Um, those and the cables uh, will cost you less than a thousand pounds. So it's two two cables and two PCI cards. So when you want to stand up another server, it's not a case of having to go out and shop for all of those um, I/O components that you'd normally buy. It is just a case of buying the the, the simple components that connect it to connect that server to the back of our appliance. When the appliance is shipped, it, it, the the back of it is is always fully populated with. Uh, the interface cards to the servers. So the only thing you need to buy when you stand up a new server is the, the two cards and the cables themselves. So it, it, the, the, the client is always ready to receive uh, more servers, uh, up, up to 15. Uh, as I said, it, it's designed as a top of rack appliance. So we, we've allowed for 15 slots at the back, which you can use for 15 servers, in which case you have two of these cables to each, um, each server, uh, uh, or you can have dual port cards at the back to allow you to connect up to 30 servers. One of the things that actually what I should have mentioned, so if you, if you look at um, 
sorry for jumping back here. If you look at the, the there is a deliberate um, uh, choice of server here. Uh, remember I said about um, the components actually in a server and how they've evolved over the last uh, yeah, 15 years and, and they continue to evolve. CPUs have typically got 12 to 16 cores today. People are buying um, these larger servers that you see illustrated here because they need that compute capacity because they want to put more memory in. All of those components in a server have become commoditized. Uh, and you can get a machine or a server that's pretty powerful and able to run multiple VMs for relatively small money. What the, the, the bottleneck today is in the I.O., so the more VMs that you run, uh, more applications that you run on that server, the more bandwidth that they need, the more dedicated bandwidth to avoid contention that they'll need, and hence the need for a large number of these one gig ports at the back of the um, out, or out of that server. So the the reason that people choose these larger for you servers that's illustrated there isn't because they need the compute capacity. It's usually because they want a larger number of slots to put more cards in to carry the I/O in and out of that that server. Uh, and again, uh, if you only need to put two PCI slots uh, cards in there, so your choice of server can change. So the next server that you buy, uh, even if you've got a bunch of legacy servers that you've connected to VNet, uh, the next server, you, your choice of server can be much, much smaller. Uh, and I, I, I did flick through that first slide showing our customers a, a bit quickly, but one, one of those is Rackspace, um, obviously a large hosting provider, as, as you probably know, but for them, um, the size of the server and what they can fit into a rack or how many of those they can fit into a rack is it, it, actually paramount. And as I go through some of these, um, one of the uh, benefits that you see there is, is increased density. And, and that is a huge benefit for um, managed service providers, for hosting providers like Rackspace, because they can get much more value out of the footprint of every rack. So let's um, just cover those. So uh, where, these are, where the benefits fall into these areas, just in terms of deployment, uh, increased availability and agility, obviously power and cooling and um, density are important. But w w one thing that we find a lot of customers are wary of is introducing more tech into, uh, and more standards, if you like, uh, into their organization and having, having more to worry about, more, more to manage. I said all of our technology and where our core competence is, is in PCI. All of this um, platform is based around uh, PCI switching. So when you introduce this, um, so for those cards, for example, uh, when you introduce those into a server, you don't need special drivers for those cards and those adapters to run. They are just, what the server sees is just a PCI bridge that's extended that PCI bus up to the top of the rack. And then, what effectively you're plugging into that is just standard Intel, Nix, and Emulex HPAs. So there is no change in the governance model of what those actual services see, what drivers you need. They're all based on um, current standards. Uh, so you don't need to actually introduce anything new into the organization. So uh, again, further metrics on each one of those uh, business benefits that we explored. Um, the slide here just simply looks at um, the, the component cost, uh, so the capex of uh, a typical rack. Most racks, as I said, will be one gig uh, at the moment, so they will have the, the highest uh, component count, a large number of switches required because, as I said, if each one of those servers is, has got a, a quad one gig um, card and it's got, I don't know, four, three or four of those, there are probably 12, 12 to 16 uh, one gig ports coming out of each. Um, and, and that's not unreasonable for um, the, you know, the number of VMs that they can run. If they can run 30 virtual machines, 30 apps, you're probably going to need that many number of ports to avoid contention between uh, applications, particularly at, at peak loads. Um, so just, just look on, uh, at the component count, but th these are the numbers that, that we kind of come, come up with. And what we've tried to do is be uh, 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 try and compare apples with apples and just use this pricing for all of these. So you may not pay this much for the I.O. infrastructure in your rack, but it allows us to uh, make a like-to-like -like comparison. 
if you go, if you already are lucky enough to have 10 gig the, 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 in, in your estate um, and, and in the racks as well, the, the component count goes down, and so does the cost. The, the, the 10 gig adapters that they're not physically any smaller, but they also um, the, the price tag is much higher. So overall, the price goes down, but but not by much. Introducing VNet, on the other hand, into uh, the estate allows you, first of all, to choose those smaller servers, reduce the component count substantially, uh, and um, you know, make these capital cost savings. And you only have to buy those components, much the same way as a, as a traditional server, but you only have to buy cheaper components, as, as I, I should say, every time you, um, every time you, you stand up a new server. Speed of deployment. Um, I, I, I don't know what you guys go through when you have to um, stand up a new server, but you know, just getting it ready and getting it up and running and into production um, it usually involves multiple teams in, in an organization. So you may well you know, unpack it, vote, test it, put memory in, whatever else. Uh, but when all of that, even that, is said and done, you still need to generally rely on uh, a networking team um, just hiding this, I'm not sure. uh, to provision or to make provision for that server both on your LAN uh, and the SAN before it can actually come up and do, do useful work. With VNet in place, that part of it can actually happen before the server is delivered. So you can pre-provision um, the, the resources on the SAN and the LAN for that server before it's arrived. And then instantly when it arrives, the only thing you actually need to install is those two PCI cards and plug it into the back of the appliance. And that's it done. And you can do that. But so the, the again for hosting providers, um, um, managed service companies, that, that that's critical. So you know, if you've got a customer that wants to host a, uh, another application on your uh, on your infrastructure, all of that process becomes much simpler uh, and faster as well. So you start making money quicker. This slide is um, really talking about availability and, uh, and um, agility, I, I guess, in virtualized uh, uh, states. If you uh, are running um, VMware, and one of the coolest things about VMware is being able to vMotion your apps from one physical host to another, um, because um, because all of our so, so all of the servers that are connected to an appliance. They're connected to that appliance at 40 gig, so 40 gigabit. If you V motion, if you V motion from one to another, um, the the bandwidth available between the the current host and the target host is considerably larger than if you were trying to do this through the one gig port that each of those VMs have available. So the the process of V motion. Um, I, I don't think it really takes hours, but you know you, it can be reduced from minutes to less than a second. So, so that all of that happens a lot quicker, um, rather than uh, you know, rather than having to uh, use the, the sort of narrow narrow bandwidth available. Power and cooling. Um, have a quick look at that. So remember all those cables. Um, so so just, just just consider the cables. Um, each. Ethernet cable consumes about five watts, and if you have 180 of those in a rack uh, in a day, that, that's quite a lot of power that, that, that you've consumed. The, uh, it's outside of the I/O infrastructure, though, uh, remember those bigger servers. I, I, I said people aren't choosing those because of um, their compute capacity. It's more because of the available I/O out of a larger number of slots. Um, if you're able to choose smaller servers, um, but they're going to have smaller power, power supplies, they're going to consume less power anyway uh, and require le less cooling. So both in the I.O. infrastructure and what that um, more lean, efficient I.O. infrastructure allows you to choose for the rest of the estate, so smaller servers, lets you make some substantial uh, power and cooling cost savings. Uh, and I mentioned this already with uh, rack based density. Um, if you can choose smaller servers, Rackspace uh, went down to the half U servers. Which is, in, in practice, it was a, a one U pizza box star server with, with two, two side by side. 
uh, and that allowed them to fit a lot more into one rack. Um, and the, the, the sort of virtual machine or application density per rack uh, goes up substantially uh, with, with some space left as well. And last one, um, we're just sticking to common standards. So we're not introducing anything um, new into this date. These cards at the bottom there, as I said, are straightforward um, PCI uh, adapter cards that, that fit in there. And then there's a PCI cable uh, up to three meters that um, goes to, to the top of the rack. So all of this is built on, pretty much on, on, on current standards. Um, the cards at the front here are the same ones that you would, so remember at the beginning I, I said, um, uh, I, I talked about single root IOV and multi root IOV. It's the same adapters that would fit in there and then be delivered as virtual NICs. Um, I think there is, actually, before I go into it, I think there is another slide that goes, it sort of illustrates this. Um, but it, it's exactly the same cards. Uh, that come from Intel uh, and Emulex, and what the server sees or, or the hypervisor sees is exactly the same thing that it would see, so it's requiring the same drivers. Um, the only thing is, up to this uh, appliance here, uh, you have 40 gig available. If, um, can anybody see, if I go back to, I was trying to see a slide that illustrates this, well, the, the one of the reasons that uh, um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about blades. Uh, one of the reasons that people choose blade chassis is uh, density of compute, I guess. And one of the problems that uh, I think some of the original chassis had was because it was so dense, power and uh, sorry, cooling was, was a problem. What we've effectively done is taken the I/O out in exactly the same way. Uh, that the back plane of, of a blade chassis carries all the I.O. for each of the blades that are in there. That's effectively what we've done. We've consolidated the I.O. up to the, the top of the rack. So uh, the, the flexibility and the intelligence that you get with blade servers, we can now provide back to some really old servers, you know, any legacy service that you might have running some old applications. We can uh, deliver that in the rack. So the I.O. is in the custody of our appliance at the top of the rack, just the same as it would be uh, in the, the sort of sh the chassis and back plane of um, a, a blade, blade servers. Except, of course, you don't get the, um, um, this is much cheaper, and <laughs> you you're not locked into the technology and the limitations of, um, uh, of a blade chassis. 10 gig, uh, again, it isn't a, uh, a cheap uh, proposition. Uh, sorry, let me just take a quick look at time. Uh, it, 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 it's still quite an expensive proposition to, to sort of undertake within a, a whole. Um, can everybody hear me? I've just got a, a message popped up about uh, uh, difficulties with audio conference. Ian, can you hear me? Yeah, no, you're fine. Oh, okay, all right. Sorry, there's a little I think that was that was from earlier. I think. Oh, okay, all right. So it just popped up on my, my screen here. Uh, okay, so uh, as I said, moving from one gig to ten gig in Iraq, uh, a lot of components to, uh, to replace, and they certainly are not cheap. Uh, and the same story with conversion. Actually, we're, we're starting to see these arrive. Where you have fiber channel and Ethernet on the same adapter, but you know, I, I've priced these up before, and they're not less than um, yeah, you know, eight to twelve hundred pounds is what you're talking about. Whereas the PCI cards that we slot into. Um, our servers at the back here, as you, you see, uh, they're, they're around about um, 200 pounds. So this is a, a quick topology diagram. I'm going to try and speed things up a bit here, um, so we've got time for the, the, the demo of the GUI at, at the end. Um, very simply, each of these servers connects to the back of the appliance through a PCI extender cable, and all the I/O now leaves that appliance or leaves the rack through. Uh, through the front of that appliance, so over to your SAN uh, and over to the network. And the management of it is all now virtualized and it's just done through a GUI. So you can deliver the um, I.O. resources that would have been in there just through, um, just, just through the GUI. And this is a sort of, uh, uh, I, I guess it's a software stack of a virtual machine on a hypervisor which then uses um, fiber channel Ethernet drivers to talk to um, NICs and HPAs 
in the physical service. So, so that, that's what's happening today, and then that's carried by quite a large number of cables to the top of the rack, and then out to your fan and LAN. Um, lots of cables, lots of components, lots of cost. What VNet does is remove those physical components out of there, but within the server itself, you've still got the standard drivers. So as far as the server and the apps are concerned, and the VM is concerned, uh, you, there is absolutely no change. What has happened, though, is the physical resources have now moved out to um, the, the, the VNets, which are at the top of the rack. Uh, I think the last topology diagram only showed one, but typically you'd have uh, two for redundancy. And now you only have a couple of cables connecting each of those servers to um, to the top of rack appliances, and then it's the, the modules at the front that carry that out to uh, to the fan and the lab. So considerably less hardware um, and less uh, opex as well. And the last part about um, you know speeding up that accelerating that virtualization. Uh, because the I.O. is all in the custody of this appliance here, so we're just looking at one, in the front of that is where uh, our, you know, our, our intellectual property lies, is in that PCI switching. Uh, we've, we've actually got chips that, that do that. And then within each VNet, there are three of those which then allow you to, um, first of all, deliver these virtual NICs back to each server. But if there is uh, any communication going from one server to another, it doesn't actually need to leave the rack. It just goes straight through, switched through here, and back out to, to another server. So things like that V-motion, which I described, uh, are, are considerably easier. Uh, and there's another cool thing that, we're, that allows you to do, which, I, which is probably better illustrated when I um, show you the, the, the um, GUI demo. So uh, I think we're on the last slide now, which uh, just gives you some metrics, again, about some of the things that we um, or savings you can make. Um, th 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 this is good because for uh, you know we, we can show like for like savings against um, traditional I/O hardware. But the, you know to be honest, the real benefits are uh, the, the operational. So um, being able to deliver stand-up servers, install new VMs becomes so much simpler, and management of those is, is considerably easier. What isn't discussed here, uh, and the, actually the, the cables part, yeah, it is extremely important because um, not just in terms of clutter and efficiency, it, there's actually huge minimization of risk in the organization. Um, there's a great statistic, uh, and one day I'll find out who's attributed to, that 85% of all data center issues are as a direct result of some change. Now, if you imagine, uh, you open up a, um, a, a, a door at the back of a rack, there's a whole bunch of cables. When you shut that, it's really easy to crush a cable. It's really easy when you're putting a new NIC into a server that you have to pull out to plug it into the wrong port or disturb something else. And that's the kind of activity that we or we, we do away with altogether. Uh, because once that solution is wired up, very much like a blade, that's it. You don't need to touch it again. And to be honest, most larger organizations do have their racks delivered like that because they understand that any changes to that rack can, are extremely risky for applications that are running uh, or to maintain availability. So what they tend to do is wire them up uh, and leave it. But it makes, the, makes their business applications extremely rigid, and certainly that they lose a lot of agility uh, in doing that. So uh, a quick um, close. I, I, sorry, I thought the previous one was last slide was the last one. This is just a uh, hosting provider. Um, it, well, we do show some cost savings here, but you know, to, to be honest with them, it was the cables the, um, that were, were a problem. Uh, their cables weren't under the floor; they're carried uh, on a catenary at the back of uh, each row, uh, a row of racks, uh, and they had a health and safety issue. I mean, cables are copper; it's metal. It, it, if you have a bunch of these, especially 180 per rack, um, that they can be quite heavy. Uh, so they had a health and safety issue with um, you know, the, the number of cables that uh, um, were leaving the rack. Uh, and typical, um, uh, typical conflict uh, for um, the, the, the appliances themselves. I'm going to switch out of this uh, and just go to, so, so uh, I'm going to jump to the GUI, just spend um, five minutes on this. Uh, just sign in here. While I'm doing that, it's worth having a look at um, 
on our website we have uh, on the top menu you'll see resources and under resources there's a bunch of videos uh, and, in, and they they're very bite sized they're sort of two to three minutes each but they do uh, provide a very easy to understand um, uh, w w way to understand some of the things I've been talking about today so this is our um, GUI that manages uh, the VNet. So what you see here on the uh, top left is um, the back of the appliance and you can see uh, the different slots. So what flashes up are the, the servers that are plugged into each one of the slots at the back. Okay. Um, I think in most organizations these servers would have not logical names like this but characters out of uh, Lord of the Rings or, or, or something like that or Star Trek. Um, so, uh, and at the front of the appliance, you see a uh, sort of status of the different I/O modules that, that are plugged in. And again, uh, we can see what they actually physically are uh, when we click each one, and, and they flash up as either Ethernet or, or fiber channel in this case. Um, and when you click on a particular server, um, so these are now connected uh, through PCI to the back of the appliance. Okay, uh, and let's say we want to add a um, a, a network interface, uh, a NIC to uh, an Ethernet NIC to this server. So this is um, the same Intel NIC that resides in this slot that it would normally have seen. That instead of having to open up the server and uh, install it and cable it up to the top of rack switch, what we can do is just drag and drop it onto that device. So what if we look at this now? What we what we're able to do is for one of the sorry one of these we're able to allocate up to 16 of those adapters and we've used up one. So if I go and drop another one onto that server, you can see that I've now got 14 left and that's a, a assignment succeeded. I can go and get another one from this front end uh, IO module and drop another one onto each one of these servers. And if I keep doing that, you'll see you'll see this little fuel gauge uh, kind of drops down uh, as well. It, it shows you how much of that resource has been um, allocated out, out to different servers. And it's as simple as that. And we can do the same thing with um, fiber channel. And it's as simple as that. Now, I can go back to each one of these, and it shows me what servers, oh, sorry, what resources uh, are allocated to them. I didn't put anything down on that one. Uh, let's say that this server um, has a problem or needs to fail over to this device here, uh, this server here. In, in the normal traditional world, that server would have its own network interface card uh, going to the top of the rack, going out to the core, and for each of those physical resources, it would have its own MAC address and worldwide name. So if you want to fail over that server, that first one, across to this target, um, the, the applications might be easy to do, but the physical resources um, still have uh, different MAC addresses and worldwide names. With, because all of that now is in the custody of our appliance, and it's the appliance that's actually sending out I.O. to the core and back again, what we can do is just... Uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm on a hand so I'm just going to... What we can do is select the resources that that server has got and then allocate them and move them across to a different server. So the applications that we've moved across now have been reassigned to a completely different server. And that's without you know, visiting the data center. You can do this from... Um, you, you'll see on one of the videos, you can do that just you know, from an iPad running a, a, a web page uh, going to... Um, the management interface that I've got here, and just doing that without actually setting foot in the data center, opening it up, and pulling out cards or anything like that. So, for for the purpose of, um, as I said, fading over to uh, a different target, that becomes much much simpler because all of these um, resources are are virtualized. And really, th this is um, in in a uh, if you're doing a V motion, for example. As I said, all of that is all of that I/O from one server to the next is just travelling through uh, the back of the appliance. It doesn't need to leave any, you know, to go outside the rack at all. So it, it is much, much quicker and much simpler. Uh, and that 
pretty much it. I mean, you, it, it becomes very easy to allocate these resources. Um, we have got um, there's eight. There's actually twelve slots, but only eight of those uh, are used. So, if you, uh, I think I've mentioned it. If, if you only have um, iSCSI, if you've got an iSCSI account, and uh, you, you, you can only you can start with just a couple of um, Ethernet modules, if you wish. All of the modules are uh, 10 gig uh, up to the core. They're all dual port, so you can fit uh, 80 of those doubled up to uh, sorry, eight of those, so you can get 160 gigabits out of the switch uh, if, if need be. Um, typically, we'll see uh, customers starting with um, one fiber channel module, typically two two appliances for redundancy, a fiber channel module in each, and a couple of 10 gig Ethernet uh, modules in each. But what we normally do is um, go through a sort of siting exercise to uh, get a good idea of what you actually need. But as I said, these are hot pluggable. You can go and add these resources um, as you need. So um, I hope that gives you a good idea of what we're able to do. Um, that the, and how easy it is to actually provision these resources and manage those resources as well uh, from one server to the next. Um, what I'll do is, I'm not sure if I need to do anything to open the floor up for questions, but uh, um, if anybody wants me to cover anything else, um, yeah, happy to take your, your questions. Uh, thanks, Zahid. Um, I'll just um, take control back. Okay, so um, as I said at the beginning, if, if you had any questions, um, you can uh, use the panel uh, to, uh, to put them in and, and we'll answer them as best we can. Um, in terms of uh, next steps, uh, I just, just hope you've, you've enjoyed the webinar. It's certainly um, something that uh, we position to some of our existing clients and you know, they're ex in extremely interested in the technology. Um, in terms of um, the way that um, you you might want to take things forward, you know, we uh, we'd suggest you take the product on an evaluation and you know you try it for yourself because you know this type of technology you, you have to see it working, it has to prove that it's reliable, it has to um, you know you have to prove to yourself and and your management team that it actually delivers. Uh, what we say it does and, and, the, and the cost savings and so on. So if, if you're interested in that, then obviously um, you know, please get in touch. Uh, we'll be, um, we'll be uh, issuing the recording of the presentation um, and also the slides, sending out the slides as well. So um, I'm not sure if anybody's got any questions. Um, have then well, that's pretty comprehensive. You know, I mean, obviously, the head with a pretty comprehensive um, overview of the technology. I, I okay. just, uh, I just wanted you mentioned rack space there a couple of times. Um, so, hey, do, do you have anybody that's sort of more in the in the corporate world that you can mention, maybe not by name, but yeah, just in yeah, uh, absolutely. So, um, we, as I said, the product's only been around for uh, a year here. Um, we uh, we've got actually got customers who from who fall into different sizes. So there are those who um, like the agility, being able to just you know wire up the rack once and not touch it. And they are the customer who's only got half a dozen servers. Um, they've got five channel and Ethernet, but yeah, all they've done is they've probably spent a little bit more on our technology for the operational benefit. There's others that uh, where I gave you that uh, hosting provider. Um, their issue was just large number of cables, but they are standing up racks uh, every day. So, uh, sorry, every week they um, they've installed a new rack, so they know that they can make uh, X amount in just the capex savings uh, over the, the course of the year. Um, some of the others, uh, there's another uh, information services provider um, who, again, has got, I mean, they've got a reasonable estate. It is virtualized. They've got a mix of different OSs uh, running as well. It's not just all under VMware, so it's, it is a truly mixed estate. 
but we're, we're agnostic to that. We, we just say, you know, will we take a PCI extension out of each server, no matter what flavor it is, uh, and we provide I/O for it. Um, that's it. So that those, that there's no, you know, restrictions on it. Has to be a certain fit to um, to get the benefits that are available for everybody. Okay. Um, okay. I think um, if I'd like to thank you for your times ahead and uh, every, everybody that attended. Um, and as I say, we're, we're the next uh, session we're going to be running in a couple of weeks' time will be on the, the NetApp B series. So um, again, thank you for your, for your attention, and um, I bid you farewell. Thank you very much.